How to run a pen test? Uh, that's a broad question. There is a lot of stuff to know. Today I will do a big tutorial. That's gonna be a long one and I will break it down in many parts actually, uh, just to make it more easy for you to search for what you're looking for. So I will start by how different are Nippon tests compared to other regular carnivorous plants that you can find in a random nursery. If you treat them the same way as other carnivorous plants, they may not like it. Then I will talk about the best soil for Nippon tests because you cannot have the same soil for Nippon tests as you have for Saracenia or Dionea. Then I will explain you how to repot your Nippon tests because you may need to repot the plants you just bought, uh, especially when it's coming from nursery, you want to repot that in fresh, good substrate. Then we'll talk about the water. What is the cheapest water you can use for Nippon tests? And I will explain you how to water your Nippon test too. Then I will talk about uh, the amount of light Nippon test needs. As you see here, it's kind of bright, so uh, it's totally fine. You have to understand what they need and uh, how to not give too much or too low. If you want some pictures, obviously. I will also talk about can you grow Nippon test in a lower humidity? Uh, when the humidity is not high, uh, is there a way to gr still grow the pontes on your windowsill, for example? I will also touch on uh, should you add an extra light during winter, because uh, obviously the sun is not really providing enough light, the days are shorter, the power of the sun is uh, less powerful. So do you need an extra light for winter or not? I will also touch on if you need to fertilize your Nippon test and how to spot if your Nippon test actually is uh, having enough nutrients. I will talk about the good temperature range that you should have to grow Nippon test on your windowsill and I will explain you why sometimes it will impact the choice of the species or the cross that you will buy for your windowsill. I will also talk about how to propagate Nippon test from cuttings and from seeds. So we'll touch quickly on uh, the flowers and uh, how to pollinate, how to make your own seeds. I will let you know how long live a regular Nippon test if everything is okay, the lifespan. I will explain you the common problem uh, people have growing Nippon tests uh, at home and how to fix them, how to solve this problem. Then it will be a list of the easiest Nippon test species or cross that you can buy and uh, the beginner friendly that will uh, forgive you if you do something wrong. So that's always the best way to start. You don't want to start with a really uh, picky Nippon test because you will fail. Then you will think, oh, I'm not good with Nippon test. No, start by a really robust one that will be forgiving. And then uh, once you are uh, managing your skills and your knowledge, then you can step up to go with a pickier species. I will explain you how to create the best condition for your Nippon test uh, at home. So they grow nicely, they picture, and then you build up confidence and th that this way you get more knowledgeable and then you start really to know what you're doing. Uh, we will talk about what should you buy as uh, items, the tools that you should uh, at least consider buying if you have this or that problem uh, that may help you uh, on the long run. So sometimes it's better to have only one plant, but have the good tools around to have it pitcher than buying seven plants and none of them are, are happy and pitching. So you have to choose what you want. And sometimes spending $20 could be a big game changer if you have the right tools or item. And I will also add a few tips, but uh, let's directly start by why Nippon tests are so different compared to other carnivorous plants you can find in random nursery. Hi, my name is Remy and I love Nippon tests. In classic nurseries, you will find carnivorous plants uh, in a, a corner uh, with uh, every kind of carnivorous plant in the same pack. Uh, they, they are just sorted the same way. Uh, for those people in the nursery, it's because they don't know. They know about probably 200 species of plants. They cannot be specialized in carnivorous plants. And if you ask to this nursery how specific are the Nippon tests compared to other Dionea or Saracenia, most nursery will tell you there is no difference. Just grow them the same way. But um, that's just uh, as if you were to buy a fish. 
and uh, you go and you ask the seller, oh, this clownfish, how can I uh, make it happy? It will tell you, oh, it's a fish. Put that into water and that's it. Uh, the fish will probably never survive. Uh, all fish have different needs, temperature, and if it's uh, fresh water or salt water, that's a big difference. For Nepenthes, it's exactly the same. You cannot compare them with bog plants. You cannot compare them uh, that uh, plants that grow on the level of the sea and the one that grow on the mountain. That's not the same temperature at night. Absolutely not. So um, it's more complicated than that. They just don't know. Uh, for example, um, Dionea, the Venus flytrap, Saracenia, the trumpet pitcher, uh, and other kind of uh, Drosera and the Pinguicula, they grow in bog. So that's uh, a huge uh, prairie, kind of a prairie, uh, flooded uh, with a lot of peat moss and sphagnum moss, etc. So it's really, really, really uh, humid. The soil is just mud. And these plants grow on the top of this uh, muddy substrate. So it's really loaded with water. And sometimes plants like uh, Drosera, the one that are light, they will grow on a raft, a piece of sphagnum that is floating on the top of the water. So you cannot be more water loaded than that. Because there is no tree in this uh, bog, uh, because again, it's muddy. So even the roots would have a hard time to keep the, the tree up. So uh, there is no shadow. It's plain full uh, blast of sunshine. That's great for Drosera, Saracenia, uh, the Dionea. That's great. But uh, Nepenthes, they grow in forest. So they are in the shadow. It's not muddy. It's regular soil. And some, if not all, Nepenthes grow in um, a substrate that is really well drained. Uh, so even sometimes epiphytes. So there is not a lot of uh, water around the roots. So that's why Nepenthes, if you water them too much, they will have what we call root rot because the roots uh, don't have enough oxygen. They are suffocating in this muddy substrate and then they die. So again, big difference, less sun for the Nepenthes or less powerful and uh, less water on the roots, uh, substrate with a more drainage and air around the roots. And all the carnivorous plants that they sell uh, on this nursery, they are uh, mostly temperate species. They will need a winter dormancy. Dionea, Saracenia, uh, a lot of Drosera and Pigwincula, they will need that. Uh, they need to rest during winter because where they live, there is winter. So they rest and then they will uh, grow back in spring when the temperature is warmer. It's really like you. You will sleep at night and then usually in the morning after a coffee, you're fresh and ready to go. But if this Dionea and uh, Saracenia don't rest during winter, they will get exhausted. And after a few years, they will die. Just as you would die if you don't sleep for a week or two, you will die. You need, this is a need, you need to sleep. And the better sleep you have, the better day you will have. So, uh, the Nepenthes, the big difference is uh, they don't have any winter there. They live in tropical climates. Even during winter, maybe the temperature drop like less, uh, five degree, 10 degree, uh, less than what they have in summer. It's always warm. Uh, it's never even uh, close to a freezing point. Uh, not for the, the whole day, I mean. Sometimes they will, some species in the mountain will be able to handle uh, really cold nights, but then the day is warm to uh, plus 15 degrees Celsius. So clearly uh, it's not freezing point here. That's why Nepenthes do not need a dormancy. Actually, they will stop picturing if it's too cold. So. That's a, again a big, big difference compared to other carnivorous plants. So uh, soft, light, sun, uh, well-drained substrate, and then temperature like at home, something that is more tropical. Not really warm, but still warm enough for you to be in t-shirts, right? So the best soil, uh, I would highly recommend sphagnum moss and perlite. 
and you can go depending of your setup. Uh, mine, for example, on the window seal, I can go with 70% sphagnum and 30% perlite, even if I'm more 60 40. Just because if there is too much water, because of the well drained substrate, all the water will drop and then it won't stay on the soil. But if you keep the pits that uh, they use on nursery, uh, that retain a lot of water. That will suffocate the roots in no time. That's great for bug plants. But for Nepenthes, no. You need something more drained. And the cheapest and easiest way to do that is sphagnum moss, because it will retain a lot of water, but the excess will drop, and perlite, because again, that's more drainage. So it will uh, help the substrate to never really suffocate. And about that, you want the pot to not stay in water. Uh, you need to raise the pot a little so all the excess of water drop in the saucer or the tray that you have under. But do not let them sit in water as you would do for bug plants. Repotting Nepenthes scares a lot of beginners, but there is nothing really complicated here. Just take your time and be delicate. The first step is to unpot the plant. So you press the pot and unpot it uh, nicely. And then you will try to remove as much substrate as you can. Don't hesitate to put water on the substrate, even to put the whole pot inside the water and just uh, gently uh, shake it and uh, do your best. You don't have to be perfect. If there is still some um, substrate around the roots, is totally fine. What you don't want is to break a lot of roots. That's gonna be worse. So it's better sometimes to leave a little bit of substrate than trying to uh, take everything and, and then break a lot of roots that will force the plants to stop growing, to grow new roots. So you won't have new leaves, you won't have new pictures. It will grow back some new roots. So after that, uh, you put a little bit of substrate, like uh, a little bit less than half, I would say. And then you will put the plants with the roots, uh, wrap them into sphagnum, uh, put a, a, like a bowl of sphagnum moss or substrate. And then you fill up the rest of the pot and that's it. The thing that is a good practice would be cutting all the almost dead leaves, the dead leaves of stew, uh, the leaves that prevent you to water the pot properly, so at least the water reach the substrate and cut all the old pictures. Uh, have a good clean plant after repotting, that's gonna save you time for later. So now the cheapest water for Nepenthes. Uh, the cheapest is rain. Rain um, is great, uh, melted snow, same. Uh, that's really a pure water, not too pure. Nepenthes are more tolerant to uh, minerals and uh, nutrients. Uh, still do not use tap water. No, this is loaded with uh, bad stuff here. A lot of minerals, uh, the city is using some chemicals that don't harm us, but chemicals that will clean the pipe uh, that will kill your Nepenthes. Uh, if not immediately, it will take maybe six months, a year, two years, but they will die. It's a sure thing. Uh, tap water, except if you have a really clean tap water and then you need to test it often because I heard someone had great tap water and then the city decided to treat the pipe without noticing the people because they don't. And then this person was watering all the Nepenthes with that, and when the chemicals hit, uh, that was a bad experience for this one. So um, you really want to be careful with the tap water. So the best water is rainwater because that's free. Uh, if you want, you can use uh, reverse osmosis because it will be super clean, but keep in mind that to produce reverse osmosis water, you need to waste regular water. Uh, a part of the tap water will go and become reverse. The other one will just go in the sink. So there is a price for that, plus the fact that you need a, a device to reverse osmosis uh, that. So um, I would highly recommend you to save a little bit of money, 
get a bucket and when it's raining, just uh, collect this water, put that into bottles or whatever, and then you will be able to have like a stock of clean rain water. And uh, even if it's uh, rainy uh, or uh, snowing here in Canada, uh, you melt the snow and that's it. Uh, it's clean water. That's what I use, and uh, as you can tell, they are not uh, unhappy. Okay, so now how often should you water your Nepenthes? Ah, that's a big question in fact, because it depends on your condition. For example, here on the windowsill, I will water every week. Sometime every two weeks if uh, it's not really dry. For me, it's drier during winter because it's uh, really cold outside and the furnace is hitting the house. It's dry air. So um, uh, you, you need more water because the substrates will dry faster. If those same plants were in um, a grow tent or a terrarium, there is almost no evaporation because it's closed a box, so the humidity is not going uh, really uh, evaporating a lot. So the substrate will take longer to really dry, to get bone dry. So you could water every two weeks, maybe even three. Uh, if you have a sprayer, for example, on the terrarium or the goat sand, that will also help a lot uh, because uh, the humidity around will be high so uh, the water on the substrate will evaporate even less. But for example, if uh, I was uh, in a really dry climate, I would probably need to water more. And again, if I have a tray of water collecting the excess of water, I can water all I want, everything will land in this tray, so the substrate is water loaded at maximum, and the water in this tray will evaporate and create a little bit like a bubble of humidity around the plants. That will also help the plants to picture and grow nicely. How much light a Nepenthes plant need? Um, that's easy, a lot. A lot, but not too uh, like harsh light, not too strong. Uh, they grow in forest, remember? So in forest, it can be really, really bright, but usually there is a little bit of shadow at some moments of the day, and uh, that's exactly what you want. Uh, all the lowland plants that live uh, in the forest at the level of the sea, it's a lot of humidity there, and it's a lot of shadow. If you are more in the mountain, then you will have less trees, but again, there is still a lot of trees around, so you need shadow. So bright light, but not direct sunlight for eight hours. Uh, it will burn your plants, most of them. Some will handle it, but some will just burn and get dry and you won't have any picture. So uh, go easy. Uh, for me, for example, uh, it's a house facing window. But first, I'm in Canada. Second, the sun is entering here only between fall and spring. After that, the sun is so high that the, the light, the sunlight, do not enter the house. So it's still a lot of indirect light entering, but not a direct sunlight burning the plants. So keep in mind that uh, you need to be careful. Maybe you want that to have uh, some blind or behind another plant, that would be great. Oh, big question. Can you grow Nepenthes in low humidity environment? <sighs> we will need to uh, act what is low humidity. For me, for example, uh, I tested, I have a, a sensor here at this uh, place. Uh, at the driest of the day, it will be 45%. Because uh, winter, the furnace is heating up. Uh, that's really, really dry. That's the drier I will get. 45%, 40%, that's the maximum. But uh, at the level of the plants, because of all the light sphagnum that I spray morning and evening, the humidity around here is probably higher, around 50, 55%. So 50% will uh, be something that you can aim for. Uh, if it's higher, 50 to 60, 70, that's better. 
but the minimum would should be 45%. Uh, 45% under that, that's a challenge. And that's why you raise uh, you, the humidity around the Nippon test if you have drier uh, place. You can use a humidifier, you can use uh, the water tray method, having a tray of water where the pot is not touching the water, but is raised above the water. So the water will evaporate and create this humidity around. Uh, that's how you can boost the humidity. Uh, but uh, beside that, you can spray. I do spray because of the lice sphagnum, but spraying the plants will help for 20 minutes, half an hour. So even if you want to spray all the time, uh, that's not really efficient. Not in an open space like that. If I'm on my uh, grow tent, then spraying, the effect of spraying lasts a long time because the air cannot uh, really uh, change. It's a closed environment, the humidity raises and then it's kept inside this uh, grow tent or terrarium. So now, should you buy an extra light, a grow light or regular light, but should you buy something for winter? Because again, the days are shorter, less light from outside. Uh, that may and probably will uh, be a problem for the pitchers. The plants need a certain amount of soft light for uh, the day. Uh, for me, it's around 14 hours. So if it's really sunny like that, I will turn the light off and then uh, I will add the light on the morning and the evenings or sometime I'm just, I'm just lazy, I confess. I just let the, the, the LED light uh, on because that's not consuming a lot of energy. Um, so that's also something you want to consider. Uh, LED light is great. But adding this extra light during winter that's something that uh, often is the problem. Everybody think the humidity is the problem for Nepenthes? Not fully. You can have uh, high humidity, but if you lack light, you won't have picture. It's not about the humidity. Obviously, if you have a lot of light, good light, but not a lot of humidity, that will also be a challenge. It has to be a combination of uh, the both. Um, you have to be tropical. A lot of light, a lot of humidity, and a decent temperature. So long story short, yes, I would recommend you, if you don't have pitcher during winter, add an extra light. Uh, it costs $20 uh, and uh, that will help you to have pitcher all year round. How to fertilize an Epanthes? Oh, that's easy. Um, in the wild, they will collect insects in the pitchers. So, uh, feed the pitchers. The, for example, if your, your plant is outside, it will uh, attract insects and naturally capture them, digest them, etc. Here, indoor, uh, that's different. You can go with the um, uh, beta fish pellet when the pitchers are really tiny, then you can go with one osmocot per pitcher. But uh, for that, uh, quick tips, add this osmocot in a dying pitcher. At, when the pitcher is too old, it will start dying from the top then you can add something to fertilize it because uh, then this picture is kind of ugly. Uh, you don't care if it's dying faster because when you feed or overfeed by accident, uh, the picture will die faster. That's the thing. So uh, the, the plant produces the picture to collect nutrients. Once the picture provided the nutrients, it's no longer useful and they usually can be damaged by too much food or rotting stuff inside. So usually uh, if you feed a pitcher, I would highly recommend you to feed a dying pitcher or when you have a good pitcher and another one is forming. That's the moment you want to feed the pitcher. Uh, that's how you fertilize really. You put a little bit of um, uh, beta fish pellet or osmocot in it. You can also use the liquid fertilizer that uh, people use for orchids, for example. Just keep in mind that it has to be something soft, like for orchids, because if it's too strong, it will burn the, the leaves. So you want something uh, gentle. How to know if your Nepenthes gets enough nutrients? That's a really good question. And you know what? 
I don't know, the plant cannot have not enough nutrients. It can have not enough light, but the Nepenthes plants and all the cannabis plants, they don't need uh, some food or nutrients to live. They do photosynthesis with the light and that's it. The, the food, the nutrients they will get, it's a boost. It will help to grow faster, stronger, uh, but that's it, it's not mandatory. So uh, not enough nutrients? No, you can't tell because that is not happening. But if you lack humidity or worse, light, then you will know. Uh, you will immediately know, uh, you will have no pictures and you know you're lacking something, but it's not nutrient, it's light. What is the optimal temperature range for a Nepenthes plant? Well, it's regular house temperature. Uh, th that's the best way to say, uh, especially if you have some uh, intermediate species. Most of the plants you will get in random nursery, they are intermediate. I really want you to understand properly. So, long story short, there is three kinds. There is a lowland at the level of the sea that's warm day and night. Then we have the highland. Those ones, it's in the mountain, it's warm during the day, but cold at night. And then in between, we have the intermediate. That's the one that are in the middle, not too cold at night, but not too warm. And we have the ultra highland. So those ones are really special. Uh, no need to talk about them for windowsill because they need a cold temperature, super cold at night. So that's something uh, that you won't achieve on the windowsill. So let's focus on the intermediate. The intermediates are uh, in the middle, so average uh, house temperature, I would say. Something between 18 degrees Celsius and something like uh, 28 degrees Celsius during the day. But during the night, the temperature would drop to 16 degrees Celsius to 20 uh, degrees Celsius. So it's uh, dropping, but not too much. Uh, so as you see, that's quite uh, warm, but depending of the cross, they can go uh, uh, more on the highland part or the lowland. For example, if you have an intermediate that is borderline lowland, like an Ampularia, for example, Ampularia will tolerate a lot of condition, but uh, it will prefer warmer night. Me, on the uh, window sill in Canada, the Ampularia won't picture. It's too cold. He, he won't like it. Uh, and at the opposite, uh, I have some uh, almost Highlandish plants uh, that are intermediate plus Highland. It's a, an hybrid between the two. And then they are able to really take advantage of the cold winter here in Canada. So it's really the parentage of the plants that will influence uh, what condition, what will be the best temperature for the plant. So because of uh, those three kinds of uh, grow habitats, the lowland, intermediate and highland, uh, that's why I really recommend you to have a sensor, something that will collect the data, humidity and temperature day and night. So this way you can see what kind of plants usually like this kind of condition. Tom's Carnivore, uh, it's a website I really love. It will be linked in the description. Uh, that will allow you to directly enter the name of your plant and see what is the temperature it needs usually. For the humidity, sadly enough, we don't have that. So you have to guess. But if it's an hybrid, intermediate, start by 50% and that should be okay. But for the temperature, uh, it will really depend of the cross and uh, because it's a male and female plant, the female has uh, more influence on the offspring. That's why a uh, female plant that is highland will need a colder night. If the female is a lowlander, like um, an ampularia or whatever, uh, it will need less cool night. So again, you will have to play, but uh, that's a good uh, investigation that you need to do. Knowing your condition and then finding the good match.
uh, usually for common species that you get in a random nursery? Yeah, just the temperature of your house. If you at home, you are able to be in t-shirts, that's it, it will work. Then you only have the humidity to really to manage. How to propagate Nepenthes by cuttings. So that's pretty easy. Uh, you will uh, wait for your plants to be tall enough. It will vine, start going crazy, tall, a lot of space between the leaves, uh, with no reason. It was really dense, growing dense at the beginning. It was young. And then when it starts vining, it's adult or almost adult. And then you will see the each leaf, the space in between, is really higher and higher and higher and it will just uh, go to the ceiling. Uh, so that's when you can take cuttings. You will literally cut a portion, uh, keep maybe two um, leaves on this portion. So you have the, the, the stem, then two leaves, you cut that, you put that in a Ziploc bag, for example, that's the easiest way, there is plenty of ways, uh, I have videos about that. So the easiest way is to take this cutting and then put that in a Ziploc bag with water. And for this water, I would recommend maybe reverse osmosis, something really, really clean because the rainwater could have bacteria that could harm this uh, cutting. But uh, once the, the stem is inside the water and the rest is uh, in uh, the air of the bag, in this closed Ziploc bag, then you let it be. Forget about it, giving uh, that uh, a good light. Not sunlight, do not put uh, this bag, closed bag, in your windowsill. The sun will just cook it. So you need some uh, artificial light uh, in a warm place and you wait usually something like two months, three months, and then it will grow roots and then you will put that in fresh uh, substrate and that's it. So now if you want to uh, propagate your Nepenthes via seeds, that's more complicated because the, the Nepenthes uh, plants, there is uh, two gender, really like us. There is some male plants and some female plants. So if you have only one plant, you won't have any seeds. Uh, you really need two plants and of the two gender, you will collect the pollen of the male and put that in the flower of the female. And then you wait and then you collect the seeds and then you sow them. Uh, that's, uh, that sounds easy, but that's a lot of work because again, you need to have the fresh pollen, male pollen, at the same moment as you have fresh uh, female flowers. So uh, that's a little bit tricky, but if you have a good connection around, you will find some pollen. Okay, but how to know the gender of an Epontes? You can know the gender only when it's flowering. When it's flowering, you will have the flower uh, bud and the shape of those buds uh, will uh, let you know if it's a female or a male. And if the flowers are open, you can still see. Uh, which one is which one. So here is a short video explaining that. At the beginning, the flower stalk looks like a bunch of grapes. And that's the shape of these grapes that will tell you if it's a female or a male. Let's start by the unopened female flower. The flowers are oval, especially when you compare them to the male. And once they are open, you will see also a difference. The female is rounded, where the male are totally straight. So making your own seeds is really hard because you will have to have the two gender flowering in the same time. That's why you will have to identify quickly if you have a female or a male. If you know what you're doing, you can easily harvest the male pollen and send it to the owner of a female flower. And the good practice is you will split the seeds 50-50. So what is the lifespan of an Epanthes? The oldest I got was probably 15 years. And even it was not dead. I just gave it away because I was immigrating to Canada. So my guess is it's probably 25 plus. So that can grow for a long time. Uh, you are, we are talking about more than 20 years if everything is okay. If you have root rot, 
it's gonna die. If you have stem rot, it's gonna die. Uh, you can always try to save it. Uh, it's possible, but uh, it's kind of hard and you have to research for that. Uh, but uh, a regular plant, yeah, at least 20 years with no problem. So the common problem people face when they grow Nepenthes for the first time. Uh, we already touched on the fact that it's not a bog plant, it's a forest plant. So some people will put that uh, in a direct sunlight and the leaves will dry. Uh, so you want to be gentle. Uh, some will uh, let it sit in a, a saucer of water or a tray of water. The, the roots will suffocate, root rot, done, it's dead. Another uh, classic question from beginner is why my nipple test is uh, uh, losing all the pictures. All the pictures are dying. Uh, I covered that in a previous video, uh, but uh, long story short is because this plant was grown in a place where the light was different, the humidity was different. And I'm not even talking about the fact that it was probably shipped to your place if you order that online. So uh, during the shipping, it was in the dark, less humidity, uh, the liquid in the pictures was gone. That's a lot of stress for the plants because plants don't move usually. Uh, and uh, it will uh, produce that. It will stress the plant. The plant will uh, shut down all the pictures to focus on growing new roots and growing new leaves. Because believe it or not, but if your place is drier than the place it come from, all the old leaves will die, uh, pictures same, and the new picture and new leaves will be thicker. At the opposite, if it's more humid at your place, it will be thinner. So um, the plants adapt and for that it needs to cancel everything that was produced before to produce some um, adapted uh, leaves and pictures. That's why everything is uh, shutting down, everything is dying, leaves and pictures. Oh, and uh, something else, if you received your plants and reported it and uh, broke a lot of uh, roots it, because they are really tiny, thin, black and fragile, uh, if uh, they are broken, then the plants will shut down all the pictures, stop producing any leaves, focusing on producing new roots. So for you, you see your plants and you see, oh, it's no longer growing, something is wrong. No, it's growing, but under the substrate, in the substrate, the roots are growing. And then the plants, once the roots are strong enough, it will produce back leaves and pictures. But repotting after repotting, it's really super classic to have all the pictures dying. It's, uh, I would say for me, even knowing what I'm doing, a third of the plant will stop picturing after. So, just the way it is, uh, the, the, the roots are uh, damaged, the, the plants grow new roots, that's it. But you have no stress to have about that. If you reported your plant because you just received it, wait three months to see if the plant is recovering nicely or not. And then, if it's not picturing, you can investigate, is that the lack of humidity or the lack of light? I already touched on that, but another beginner question is, all the leaves are dying. What leaves exactly? If that's the leaves at the bottom of the plant, for sure, they are old. So obviously old leaves uh, will turn yellow, then uh, brown, crispy dark, and then just die. It's normal, it's nature. The leaves are not forever. If it's the new leaves at the top, at the group point, that's different. If the new leaves are dying, that's a problem. Something is wrong with the plant. Could be too much water, could be the wrong substrate, could be poisoning, uh, you fertilized too much, or you bought some uh, substrate that was fertilized. Uh, it happened to me before uh, buying some uh, pit moss and it was uh, with fertilizer. Uh, I didn't read the small line and then it was uh, poisoning the plant. Too much food or fertilizer. So, um, if the old leaves dies, uh, it's okay. If uh, you just receive the plants and even some kind of a new leaves are dying, not the very first uh, green one, but the one that were already on the plants are dying, 
it's probably just because it's adapting to the new condition, so no stress to have about that. Wait two, three months to see if the new leaves are healthy and stay uh, green. Another question is, my Nepal test is not producing any pictures. Why? That's different. It could be two things, really. It could be the fact that uh, your uh, light is not enough, your humidity is not enough, but clearly it's missing something. If it's uh, not uh, bright enough, the plants will only produce leaves because the main source of energy comes from the photosynthesis, the leaves. So the plants will focus on that. If uh, the plants um, have enough light, but still do not produce uh, any pictures, that's probably the lack of humidity. If the humidity is not at least 50%, uh, it will have a hard time. Keep in mind, they come from tropical humid area. If it's too dry, it won't picture. That's it. So you need to uh, do something about it. Uh, you can add um, humidifier. You can add um, water trays would work too. But for example, spraying. Spraying is nice. I do it twice a day, but not for the Nepantes. Only because of the sphagnum. The sphagnum needs to be loaded with water morning and evening uh, because it will release humidity and that will help the Nepantes. So again, I'm not spraying directly for the Nepantes. If you have a Nepantes with no sphagnum moss and you spray it, it will increase the humidity for 20 minutes and then it will dry and you are back to normal. So it's not really useful uh, where a um, water tray will evaporate all day long and then that will raise the humidity around the plant. Another thing that uh, people uh, ask about is uh, they fed the pitchers and now the pitchers are dying. Yes, especially if you overfeed a pitcher, it will die faster. Uh, that's just the way it is. Once the plant uh, had the nutrients uh, it was uh, looking for, needing, it don't really need the pitcher anymore. And uh, if you overfeed, the pitcher will just uh, die even faster because uh, it could have mold in it, could have a lot of stuff. So um, go easy with the fertilizer and the food because that will kill your uh, pitchers faster. If, for example, you have a lot of uh, humidity, you want to grow this Nepantes plant on your bathroom. That's great. That's a lot of humidity there. But uh, check if there is enough light. Sometimes a small $20 light, extra light, will do the trick. It will help the plant to have enough light and obviously the humidity will be great. So that's always a good way to manage that. So check and decide if you need more light or more humidity. Uh, but uh, if you have the good drainage uh, and a classic house environment, you should be okay. So, what are the easiest uh, common hybrid you can find in random nursery? So, the most common Nepontes you find in random nursery, that's the Nepontes X Ventrata. X is cross. So, the cross, the Ventrata cross, is a cross between Ventricosa and Alata. So, Ventri, Alata, Ventrata. So that's the way they, they name that. But uh, this is a really robust cross. It's uh, the most common. Usually I would highly recommend you to start by that because at uh, random um, average house temperature, it will grow. If the humidity is not that great, it will grow. Uh, if the light is not that great or too much, it will grow. Uh, it's a forgiving plant. That's the most classic and it can be sometimes a little bit boring Maybe you want something different because, because you already had a Ventrata. Then, depending of your temperature, you can choose other uh, classic hybrids. For example, the Gaia. Uh, Gaia uh, is a little bit uh, round. Uh, the colors are great. It's easy, easier to grow when the temperature is warmer. So warmer houses, that's going to be great. If your... Um, uh, house is too cold, like my window sill during winter, you won't have any picture. The humidity will be good enough, light will be good enough, but it's a bit too cold for it. So again, because one of the parents 
uh, is more on the lowland part, so it needs warm nights. So cool nights, he won't really like it. On the other hand, if the Gaia is on the warm side, you can go with the Brixiana on the cooler side. So this is an hybrid between uh, an highland plants. So that's on the mountain, it's low EI, uh, it like it cold at night. This is a great uh, hybrid because it allows you to have cooler temperature at night and it totally handles it. And the pictures are great, they are robust, like tough, tough one, really. Not woody, but close. So uh, the pictures last forever, beautiful uh, colors, it grow nicely. Uh, the the Brixiana for me is the way to go. But if uh, you don't have, like you're not in Florida where it's really, really warm and then that may be a challenge. I never test that in warmer climates, but uh, it may be a problem. If it's really warm at night for you, at your place, you have the uh, Miranda. Miranda is also a classic hybrid. Great if your temperature is average to warm, perfect. You will have a really nice plant for that. You also have other kind of a shape. It will depend on the shape you want. Uh, you will have the um, Nepotes Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary, uh, it will have a little bit of lowland in it uh, because of the ampullaria, but the pictures will be uh, more egg shape and um, that's holding a lot of pictures. This one is known to produce a lot of pictures and hold them for a long time. And uh, that's uh, a good way to uh, at least uh, being uh, grateful, you care for your plants, there is a lot of pictures, they last forever, that's it feels good. It will build up your confidence and then you will be able to maybe change and uh, get other plants that are more demanding, but at least you know what you're worth. So the best growing condition, really, uh, that's uh, everything I said uh, until now. You need 50% humidity, good soft light, uh, you need uh, the good substrate and good water, and that's it. I would highly recommend you to use the water tray method. So uh, you have this tray of water, you raise the pot, you put the pot on the top, uh, the water do not touch the substrate, and then all this water evaporates. And because it's not touching the, the, the pot, the minerals do not evaporate. The minerals stay on the, um, uh, the tray. This way, you can use regular tap water in this tray, as long as you don't um, uh, fill up uh, the tray and it touch the, the pot. But if it's not touching, if it's raised and the water is under, all the, the tap water will evaporate and it will boost the humidity and it will cost you almost nothing. And it's a good way to boost. Um, quick note on that. If it's a windy place, this humidity evaporating will just go away. Do not put a fan on your uh, windowsill. Uh, I did. Uh, it just dries so much the humidity. Uh, this is not helping at all. So again, Try to have this humidity, 50%, random temperature, average temperature for the, the house, and that's it. And now, what tools should you buy for your Nepenthes? First, I would highly recommend you to get a sensor, something that will give you information about the temperature and the humidity. Uh, there is some uh, cheap one that you can get uh, in uh, random places from the Home Depot to uh, Amazon. They are cheap. They will give you the information at the moment. So you can see right now is this amount of humidity, this temperature. Then you will have to check on evenings what are the humidity and temperature and then on the morning and maybe at night when you come late you'd see okay what is the temperature. Then you take notes of all this. I did it at the beginning. Uh, and you have an idea of what temperature do you have uh, day and night and what humidity you have day and night. And the next step would be to get a real sensor. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a big fan of the sensor push. I have here one sensor. In the growth tent, another sensor. 
it collects uh, data every minute. Uh, it sync with your phone. So you can see, okay, this is the temperature and the humidity uh, that I had during the night two months ago. That's great. So you can really see and understand what are your conditions because it will influence the species you will get. Or at least it will give you a clue of what you should fix or search to improve. Uh, the next uh, thing to buy for me, uh, obviously the substrate, Sagnum Perlite, yes, go. Uh, go buy that because that's the best substrate and uh, it will just make your plants happy. Uh, buy a bucket of water that you that will help you to collect rainwater. That's obvious, but hey, it's it's free water, so why not taking advantage of that? Uh, what you could buy? Humidifier. Humidifier. You will need uh, some um, reverse osmosis water uh, because if you put tap water in it, that's great. But again, all the minerals won't evaporate; they will st uh, stay on this uh, humidifier. And after uh, a few months, uh, the membrane will be just uh, crusty, full of uh, minerals, and it won't work. So reverse osmosis if you use a humidifier. And if you use a humidifier and you need reverse osmosis, obviously, you can buy reverse osmosis uh, on the uh, supermarket. But a device that will uh, be connected to your tap water and provide clean zero uh, ppm water that's a good way uh, to have a healthy plant. On the same topic, I really recommend you, it costs like $10, maybe $15, uh, something to test the quality of your water. Even if you use uh, rainwater or reverse osmosis, it's always a good tool. It costs nothing, it helps you to understand what is the quality of my water, what is in it, only what the what, how the water is loaded with something. For example, me, I will use it to test uh, the percentage of fertilizer I put in my water before spraying once a week the, the plants. Um, that's a good way to know you don't give too much. Again, too much fertilizer may burn the leaves. So this is a really good way. And I tested this device on the melted snow, rainwater, that's why I know it's good. And even if uh, people will talk about pollution, no, come on, the nepotes are not that uh, sensitive. Uh, they will grow nicely with random rainwater. But testing it is always better. So now the next step for you is to check how other people grow their plants at home. On the windowsill, I have playlists for that. And on the grow tent, I have another playlist for that. So the best way for you to improve is to copy what successful people do. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, don't hesitate to support the channel. There is a link uh, below the thanks button. Uh, that helps a lot because creating all this content takes a lot of time and energy. So until next time, happy growing.